。アロハマウナウイライカマアリエ、マリエマルイロコパモアホ、ホロプナイキケカヨカパラウア。哈利阿罗哈，玛库阿卡乌曼那，麦哈阿鲁鲁伊卡雷哟，哎哟卡玛哎呀，哎玛乌那里玛哈那乌卡哎呀哎。阿乌呀，阿罗哈 ，My name is Rosie. I'm Eleni Alegato. I'm an associate professor of oceanography and the director for Sea Grant Center of Excellence in Integrated Knowledge Systems. The chant that I just shared with you is. From my familial lands of Mauna Loa Kalua Nui, on the island of Oahu. In preparing for this talk, I felt that it was extremely crucial to ground our conversations and tie them to place. I wanted to share this placard that really deeply moved me and reverberated with me when my family visited the Museum of African American History in Washington D.C. last summer. The place is about geography, but it's also about memory and imagination. People make places, even as places change people. Places are secured by individual and collective struggle and spirit. In places where culture is made, where traditions and histories are kept and lost, and where identities are created, tested, and reshaped over time. And these past several days have reminded me of my privilege as a Native Hawaiian, of knowing who my ancestors were, and where they came from. And so. While academic culture rewards those who are willing to be vagabonds and unrooted tumbleweeds,、uh, who move from place to place in search of job security, I ask that perhaps during this talk you consider the importance of place and begin to evaluate how the culture of the academy and Western sciences has benefited from colonialism and its interactions with Native peoples. And so I ask you to place yourself. Our histories of place, where we root ourselves and where we root our communities, are both shared and personal. Is there some place that's meaningful to you? Where is it, and what makes it powerful? What are the places that you carry with you, even if you don't live there anymore? And what places have you left behind? And what is your home place? For Native people, these are very complicated questions to answer because. We have been the、uh, victim of multiple waves of colonialism. Obviously, the first wave of colonialism was geographic displacement. Colonialism again is a form of domination in which at least one society seeks to exploit some set benefits believed to be found in the territory of one or more other societies. And this concept of waves of colonialism that we've been experiencing was really developed and articulated by Kyle Powis White. In an article on climate change and indigeneity in 2018, this piece here、uh, depicts the trail of tears in which the Cherokee people were forced to move from their legacy lands in the southeastern United States and into the the Midwest. And so, geographic displacement was our first taste of climate change, in a way. But our second wave of colonialism that we've all experienced and continue to experience today are socio and psychocultural. And here I'm getting really specific with Hawaii. In Hawaii, our religion was supplanted by Christianity. Our language was suppressed, so we've lost much of our history. Our nation was illegally taken over by parties supported by the United States. We've served as the metaphoric tip of the military-industrial complex in the Pacific. For many wars, and now in a time of pandemic, we're being marketed as the safest place in the United States to be a tourist. So all of this takes a huge toll on our psyche as Indigenous people. And finally, the third wave, which is to come, is the ultimate destruction of our natural and cultural resources. For Native people, our natural resources are our cultural resources, and peoples indigenous to these places will be forced to move not as the result of something that their native lifestyle has produced. But because the most technologically advanced societies on the planet built their modern lifestyles on a carbon energy foundation, and depicted in, in this in this image are both places that I'm not native to, such as in these Native Alaskans, but places that I have been and seen impacted from from coral bleaching to excessive flooding of our、uh, indigenous agricultural systems, 
and to a fish pond that I do research at that's over 800 years old. And my children are walking on the walls while the king tides are sweeping over it. How does this all kind of, how can we summarize what the impact of all of these different ways of colonialism are? Well, this is where the systemic extermination of Native people has been hand in glove with the systemic oppression of the Black community. And, you know, this pyramid of white supremacy is very ev provocative and maybe even painful and surprising that I'm showing here. Um, this was adapted by Ellen Tuzolo and Safe House Progressive Alliance for Nonviolence. And in this pyramid, every block depends on the ones below it. And if the blocks at the bottom are removed, the whole structure comes tumbling down. Now, we may think that we are exempt from these behaviors in STEM that I highlight here, behaviors that I have personally witnessed in STEM. And so these problems that plague society at large are, in fact, alive and well in STEM. In fact, these are not old problems. Uh, I want to turn to uh, Native scholar Eve Tuck, who, have, who um, in 2019 documented some of these same issues in the academy. Um, she says she spent months traveling and visiting different members of different tribes and communities, and they are totally exhausted by the new wave of clueless academics showing up to do research on them, not with them. These show up wanting to do a study that's been approved by a university, funded by a grant, and it's something that the community has already studied or doesn't want to study. And they all say the same thing, but I already have funding. Or the research say, I don't, I've taken care of everything and you won't have to do a thing, but this is never the case. And it's always so much work for the communities. The research is always on the timeline and terms of the university and funders. And communities are saying, this is just another iteration of colonial discovery of indigenous peoples. White people coming in to rescue indigenous peoples from themselves and fill up a CV while doing it. More and more communities are saying no. But in the meantime, communities still have very real research needs and they have questions that can be answered by research. And those answers will matter for the everyday life in their communities. So they reach out to university collaborators and co-write grants. These are not always funded at the same success rates as those who just show up with, at their door with a 13th study on the same thing. Are universities or agencies paying attention to the real research needs of indigenous communities? Um, it would be nice to have something like a team of researchers who can be responsive to research needs as they arise. Basically, communities want long-term collaborations with researchers who are helpers, not there to help or rescue them. And I think it's really important that some of this divide is centered in differences over the relationship between land. I think that um, wonderful work has been done in the medical research field to really define data sovereignty and um, protections for minoritized individuals. But the same has not been afforded to land. And I think that there is an inherent difference or knowledge gap between Native peoples and the Western Academy. In Hawaii, we term this difference or this inherent value system as kinship to the land or kinship to the aina. So the word aina comes from the word ai, which means to feed or sustain. And so aina means that which sustains us. So it's beyond just the simple word land or dirt or planet. And aloha aina, which means to love land, is an expression for the Hawaiian way of loving, working, and protecting the land and native environment. It is the way of the kupuna, Hawaiian elders and ancestors. At its root, aloha aina is a tenet that the land is the religion and the culture. And when Hawaiians live on and work on the land, they become knowledgeable of the life of the land. And in our daily activities, we develop a partnership with the land so as to know when to plant, fish, or heal our minds and bodies according to the ever-changing weather seasons and moons. So, you know, aloha aina sounds a lot like science, but also notice in that definition, there's the word religion, and that can often rub very uncomfortably with Western-trained scientists. And I think a lot of that has to do with the fact that as Native peoples, we're often forced to think in our Native language but speak in English, and these translations will ever be imperfect, <clears throat> and it's extremely difficult. And that's one of the dilemma of the Indigenous scientists, that Indigenous communities often have a complicated relationship with science, right? We have this intergenerational fear of science founded in good reason, which is based on a legacy of colonization and harmful application of science. And science has been experienced as disrespectful to Indigenous rights and science sovereignty. But at the same time, there's this perception that 
we need to participate in science and we need to get Native students to participate in science because if we can have students participate in scientific professions, it will support our communities. It will support Indigenous self-governance and land management. So Indigenous science are urged all the time to indigenize science, but we haven't yet created mutually beneficial relationships between these different knowledge systems. In other words, being fluid is really fluent <laughs> and fluid is very, very difficult because it's fraught with risks on all sides. In essence, it boils down to, I don't wanna be known in my community as a scientist. I wanna be known as someone working on the side of the people and the earth. And the tipping point, at least in Hawaii and at least the University of Hawaii was the 30 meter telescope in 2015. This protest sign depicted by my friend Kalei Lam Ho that says Pono science is possible really encapsulates a space that we were not able to claim. The Hawaiian word Pono means many things, including righteousness, ethical, it just means right. And so the word that Pono, that ethical science is possible really resonated with those of us who are Hawaiian scientists at this time, because at this time, we were being fed a false binary, a false dichotomy that you were either for culture or for science. And one of the underlying falsehoods is that science was being co-opted by Western science, that it was impossible to be a Western trained science and be scientist and yet be able to stand with our people and stand for their values. But when Kalei expressed and articulated these feelings, she captured and was able to create space in just one sign was able to create space for so many of us scientists and faculty members who really felt like we were being pilloried on all sides. And so um, I was part of a group to develop a process for establishing equitable relationships with community because one of the major problems with TNT, of course, was the inability of the university to establish authentic community engagement that continues today. And as you saw in the previous, you know, Twitter tweets that I shared with you from Eve Tuck, academic researchers often have their own issues, interests, and needs. I am sympathetic to this. I know I need to get my students out. I know I need to write grants, write articles. And there's this assumption by some that that cannot meet well with what community stewards' interests and needs are. Community stewards' interests and needs are on a whole nother timeline. They're on a timeline of generations an entire lifetime. But when we can bring those together and find common vision, common co-production of knowledge and resources we can leverage, this is the sweet spot that we call it where just sustained relationships can occur. This is where the good sp stuff happened and we happens. And we wanted to develop a process for how to establish that. So it's a guidance for how to build this. And it has I want to break down these words because I also think it's very important when we talk about using native words that we break them down. So the word kulana nui, kulana is your station, your condition, your what's your position, what is your stance, your attitude, your poise, your carriage, your posture, what is your standards, how do you hold yourself when you walk around in a community. And nui means to seek knowledge or information to investigate. So to put them together, these in other words are what are the research standards. And it's intended to be a living document um, so that we can um, learn from our present interactions and, and inform. So the, the, the entities that were involved in the development of this document were, of course, Sea Grant, which I'm a part of. And Sea Grant, for those of you who don't know, is part of NOAA, the National Oceanographic um, and Atmospheric Administration. And its goal is to enhance practical use, applied use of and conservation of marine and Great Lakes resources. And so Sea Grant was really our university partner that we really believed in us. And together we worked with Kuaaina Ulu Awamo, which was a grassroots community collective. And Kuaaina refers to um, the rural people. It actually was a derogatory word for, for country bumpkins who didn't assimilate. And ulu means to grow and awamo means um, responsibility or to carry something. And it's depicted by this stick, which is what Hawaiians used to carry heavy things that they couldn't carry with their two hands. And um, we worked with this community collective. And together we produced this guidance document, which you can find at this website. 
Uh, it began with a facilitated committee. There were a number of workshops with community stewards, researchers, and in addition, it was informed by a broad body of academic literature. We're not trying to reinvent the wheel. You can think of this as the greatest hits. It's definitely rooted in the collective knowledge, insight, and many years of effort contributed by communities, organizations, and experts across Hawaii. And so just to kind of um, summarize, what we pulled out of that were eight common standards that just kept coming up over and over again that are a set of best practices and guiding questions. And again, I wanna emphasize that this is a living document that continues to evolve and grow. And it has guiding questions because we want it to be process oriented. It's not a checklist, it's about promoting a dialogue and it's flexible for broad application. What it does is that it considers both researcher and community perspectives and the rights and responsibilities of both of those groups involved in developing and sustaining productive, equitable research partnerships. And so we have divided them really loosely into two. One is kind of how do you build and nurture a relationship? Pilina. Pili means close. Pilina means re relationship. And some of these are going to sound super obvious. So the first is respect. Respect the history people in place. Reciprocity. Relationships need to be um, two ways as opposed to just extractive. As researchers, we need to be aware of our self-awareness and capacity and, and what are our intentions as a place. And who are we representing? And of course, communication. We need to know who to communicate, how to communicate, and uh, make it very clear. Some people like to be text. Some people like to be called. In Hawaii, you got to show up with snacks. You can't just you know, show up to a meeting with nothing in hand, right? And once you've kind of mastered that, um, then you have the continuing dynamic. This is a'o aku a'o mai, which means learning that is given and learning received. And aloha aku, aloha mai love given and love received. And these are basically once you establish your relationship, this is the hard part. Maintaining a long-term focus. How do your projects contribute positively to the effort to care for this place? How are you engaging the community in terms of allowing them to co-learn and co-develop and co-review? How can you benefit from the strategies and methods that these local people of place know about you know, these various um, research sites and field sites? What about knowledge, ownership, and access? How um, are we going to communicate that? And how do we allow the community to continually access that and utilize that data and determine maybe how that data is shared? And finally, because all relationships come to, to bumps, when a project fails to meet these, how do we work together to identify problems and adjust a project accordingly? I kind of think of these as like rules for, for for, for marriage, right? You, just because you get married, it's not happily ever after. It's a continual process. So the impact of our kulana is that over the past two years, myself and our team, we have carried out over um, a dozen, now close to two dozen, 18 workshops and professional trainings and development. And that results in over 400 people who have been trained through this process. I just wanted to share with you briefly before I end some of the um, responses from the people who have participated in our seminars. I want to share Rob Tunin that the normal trajectory is that researchers develop questions first and then say, I want to do my research here. We want to move towards questions that come from the community and research done in collaboration with the community. And I just want to end with Hi'ile Cavello, who's the executive director of the fish pond that I work with. And she says, it spoils down to storytelling. The researchers are helping us tell our stories. When they come to Community Workday, it helps them to tell their stories better. Beyond just the people impacts, we have institutional impacts. Just last year, we began to be incorporated permanently into the request for proposals at Hawaii Sea Grant. Um, we were incorporated into Indigenous aquaculture hubs. And in last year, we were also recognized as a national best practice. And so with that, I want to um, thank everybody who has been involved in this whole process over the past five years. One of the best practices in the Kulana is to acknowledge those who contribute to research and products. And with that in mind, I want to acknowledge and thank the many individuals and organizations that have contributed time, insight, and energy to the Kulana Noi'i. And finally, I acknowledge the Kupuna who have laid the path that we walk on and whose courage gives us strength. Mahalo pakahi apau for your time and attention. If you need to reach me, this is my email address, and you can also follow me on Twitter. Mahalo.